Good afternoon and welcome to the bi-weekly meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab, CDL. I'm Alan Sherman, director of the lab. Uh, today, it's our pleasure to hear from PhD student Ennis Goloszewski, who's going to be talking about uh, ongoing research as part of his dissertation on automatically um, cryptographically binding context to messages in, in cryptographic protocols. This is joint work with uh, Dr. Ed Ziegler and uh, myself in uh, the part of uh, CDL that we call the Protocol Analysis Lab. Um, almost all of the known weaknesses in structural weaknesses in cryptographic protocol have as their adequate cryptographic binding, uh, which situation enables an adversary sometimes to take a message or part of a message out of the context and misuse it in some other context. So it's the goal in this work to develop um, a tool that will shut this down. Um, the, the tool takes a protocol specification and infers context and then outputs a modified protocol with uh, sound cryptographic bindings to try to prevent this adverse um, protocol interaction. This work is um, funded by uh, NSA uh, in the context of the Ensure uh, Cybersecurity Research class that I taught in fall of 2022. It's one of five projects in the nation that was funded. Um, and by the way, I'll be teaching that course again in the fall of 2024, and I recommend it for people who like to do um, cybersecurity research. So um, let's get going, and uh, we, we look forward to what you have to say, Ennis. All right, thank you so much. Um, welcome to the Cyber Defense Lab bi-weekly meeting. I just wanted to add that uh, Jonathan Fuchs, who's joining us here, is also contributing to this project. In the in the post quantum space, which I'll talk about sort of towards the end of the presentation, but yeah, hi. So I'm trying to defend in May of 2024, and this is essentially going to be the this is my thesis topic. So it's a topic close to my heart. So I'm going to try to share that enthusiasm with you today. So automatically binding cryptographic context to messages and network protocols using formal methods. That's a mouthful. Let's start breaking it down. Focus the wrong window. So let me first begin by convincing you that there's a problem in cryptographic protocol design. And that problem is something that we're seeing in terms of a pattern. And it has to, it concerns this idea of cryptographic binding. And specifically what it concerns is many of the protocols that we're analyzing, both old and new. So going back all the way to 1978 with the Needham Schroeder protocol, which is sort of the famous hello world example of how not to build secure protocols these days. And as recently as the FIDO UAF version 1.2 standard from 2020, which has since been superseded by FIDO 2. And things between like the session binding proxy protocol, which I spoke about earlier this semester, we're seeing that over and over again, people who design protocols are not cryptographically binding the values correctly, even when they're trying to. And that's a little bit concerning. And a, a potential solution to this problem that we've explored and sort of implemented here is that we can try to automatically perform these bindings so that it's no longer up to people designing the binding specifically. So in other words, a universal binding technique that is applicable to all protocols in a certain class. And that's like, there's a strong asterisk there. We're specifically looking at two party protocols in this work. And we require several pieces to make these bindings work in the first place. So let me first introduce what we're trying to prevent. We want to prevent this idea of protocol interaction. And I'll talk about what that is very soon, I promise. Then I'm going to introduce to you the, this idea of cryptographic context, and we'll talk about how to automatically bind to it. We're going to talk about how to generate security goals for this context binding process. Then we'll talk about what this costs, and we'll also discuss how it fits into the sort of security world once quantum computers become more prevalent, which seems to be an inevitable, inevitability at this point, but I'm not an expert, so take that with a grain of salt. And if at any point you have questions, I'm watching the chat, so feel free to interrupt me. So when we talk about formal methods, which is one of the buzzwords I sort of had on the title slide, we are specifically working in the strand space model. So the strand spaces are a formalization of protocols where essentially you have things called strands. You can think of these as the columns here. So I have two strands here, an initiator strand and a responder strand. 
And these strands will emit and receive terms. Terms are basically your messages in the protocol. And in this case, an initiator will, receive, will emit an init message and then receive a term, a response message. So essentially the black nodes are transmissions, the blue nodes are receptions. And the only caveat here is we're doing this through an insecure medium. So the Dolovial network is this idea dating back to 1983. And what this is, is basically saying, hey, we're gonna send messages to each other or terms in this case through a network. And that network is hostile. And this is actually the whole network is trying to break our protocol. Why would you want to model an adversary this way? Well, this is a pretty extreme case. So it stands to reason that if your protocol has security properties, when the entire network is working against you, it's likely that if you deploy it on a real network anywhere, you'll probably have some of those properties, right? So we're dealing with the absolute worst case here. We're emitting terms in and out of this hostile Dolovial network, which is going to manipulate and mess with these terms in whatever way it can to create protocol interactions. So let's get to what that idea is. So one of the crucial questions, by the way, in strand spaces is if you have, you know, a Dolofial network with terms coming in and out of it, and you have two strands that are emitting and receiving these terms, as we do here, the initiator strand and the responder strand, are they executing the same protocol? That is to say, are they actually mirroring the session with each other? Or are they executing, executing two different protocols or two different sessions disparate from one another with this hostile network? This is the important question. And when when the answer is no, what you're essentially getting is a man in the middle attack. So this describes structurally what a man in the middle attack is. Man in the middle attacks are a huge concern for modern protocols and old protocols. And this is sort of the attack we're trying to shut down by using cryptographic binding, right? And protocol interaction, by the way, is a special case where you have two instances of a protocol or two different protocols. And the Dolofiad network is able to transplant values or manipulate values in such a way that it essentially has two different protocols, P and Q in this case, right, as indicated by these labels below. And the messages from them are interfering with each other. That is to say, it's inserting details from one session into the other and vice versa. And you can see this sort of structure manifest in every man in the middle attack that isn't straight up exploiting like a, you know, a coding vulnerability or coding flaw. Uh, something like Heartbleed would be an example of that, right? So let's go to this classic example of Needham Schroeder. So as I pointed out before, Needham Schroeder is sort of the beloved pet example of protocol analysts. This is an old protocol from 1978, although I'm showing you the low version here from 1995, rather the attack that Lowe found in 1995, which you'll notice 17 years after the initial introduction of Needham Schroeder. So I, I, our ideas and understanding of protocol security evolved considerably in those 17 years, including the adoption of the Dolofial model which I highlighted here, and that was in 1983. Needham Schroeder is, a, is, is supposed to be a mutual authentication protocol. What that means is you have two people on the internet and they are in possession of authenticated public keys of each other. So we're using public key cryptography to speak with each other right now. WebEx is secured by HTTPS. If you look in your browser, there's a lock at the top left. You can even check the details of the certificate that WebEx has issued to us so that we can trust the, pri the public key that WebEx is claiming it has. Now, mutual authentication is a little bit stronger. Note that none of us send certificates to WebEx, so actually this authentication with WebEx only goes one way. We know we're talking to WebEx if we can trust the certificate authorities in our browser, which come pre-shipped with it, by the way. But WebEx has no idea if we are who we claim we are. And in, in this context, maybe it's not so important that it does. In Needham Schroeder, it is quite important that in this case, Alice and Charlie, who intend to communicate with each other, or would like to authenticate each other, know who the other is. But we have this problem here, which is that Alice instead is going to start talking to Eve. And this is quite on purpose. So let's step through this protocol and see what happens here. So Alice wishes to speak with Eve. The problem is Alice doesn't know if the entity Eve, or in this case, the strand Eve, is who it claims to be. So we need to engage in some sort of authentication protocol, which is the purpose of Edom Schroeder. And the way we're going to do this is as follows. Alice is going to generate what's called a nonce. So nonces come up a lot in network protocols. They're random values that you generate fresh for a session. And the purpose of a nonce is to give some unique identity to that session. So it's actually quite important that the nonces are unique. So Alice generates this unique nonce for this session, and then is going to encrypt the nonce together with her identifier. This identifier is what you'd use to look up Alice's public key. And we're going to encrypt this with Eve's public key, which we know is Eve's public key, by the way. So we're generously assuming that we have perfect knowledge of each other's public keys, which 
is not realistic, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So we encrypt this, and the benefit of using Eve's public key here is that even if we kick this through the Dolevian network, the network does not possess Eve's public key and thus cannot decrypt this message. And that's quite important. However, there's a caveat here. So Eve receives this, and then let's ignore what's happening with Charlie here for a second. Eve will respond to Alice, you know, by decrypting Alice's nonce, which Eve can do because Eve has the private key corresponding to Alice's public key. And then Eve will include a nonce that she generates and encrypt all this with public key Alice. Now, if you're looking at this at this uh, protocol diagram, you might see that there's an issue already, which is that Eve is actually sending Charlie's nonce, not a nonce that Eve generated. The reason this is possible is because Eve is malicious. Eve is actually the Dolefjad network, or at least a subsidiary of the Dolefjad network. And Eve in parallel is executing a session with Charlie, who is not a legitimate user. So to summarize, Alice is legitimate, Eve is illegitimate, Charlie is legitimate. And the problem here becomes the following. So what Eve does when receiving Alice's first message is Eve forwards the message, well, Eve extracts the values from the message. And by the way, this is protocol instance P over here, right? We talked about P and Q. Eve is gonna take Alice's nonce and Alice's name from protocol P and insert them in the protocol Q, the session Q here with Charlie. So Eve is gonna encrypt Alice's nonce, claim to be Alice and encrypt all this on the Charlie's public key. Now, Charlie, being an honest user, is going to follow the protocol faithfully. That means that Charlie is going to reply to Eve's message by extracting Alice's nonce from the first message, which Charlie can do because Charlie has the private key corresponding to Charlie's public key, right? We're going to insert that into this message here. We're going to then insert a nonce that Charlie generates, fresh for protocol Q, and we're going to encrypt all this with Alice's public key. The benefit of encrypting with Alice's public key here is that Eve cannot decrypt this message. So for Eve to extract Charlie's nonce from this message, Eve needs to invoke Alice here as a confused deputy, which is what Eve is going to do. And by the way, a confused deputy is somebody that does something helpful for the adversary just because they're doing what they're supposed to do. And the classic example is at a grocery store, if you take a label from one item that is cheap, and you put it on top of the label of another item that is more expensive, a grocery a cashier at the grocery store might scan that item, you know, faithfully following their protocol as the cashier, and be none the wiser. And this is a confused deputy. And Alice here is gonna actually end up acting as a decryption oracle for Eve and decrypt this nonce for Eve. Because Alice has no idea that this is Charlie's nonce. Alice believes that the nonce coming from Eve is Eve's nonce. So to follow the protocol, we actually have to decrypt this and send it back to Eve, which we do in the next message. The problem here is that Eve now knows Charlie's nonce and can thus reply to Charlie. So Eve will now re-encrypt this nonce that Charlie sent on the Charlie's public key. And what ends up happening here is you have a protocol interference or interaction between protocol P and protocol Q in which Eve is able to authenticate to Charlie as Alice by acting as a man in the middle in this case. This is the classic example of a bad protocol interaction and what we're trying to avoid with cryptographic binding. And if you look carefully at this protocol, the issue with this and just to make it explicit, the interference has to do with these values shifting between the, the session P and the session Q. So we absolutely don't want Alice's values from protocol session P to end up in session Q. We don't want Charlie's values from session Q to end up in P. This is sort of the scenario we're trying to avoid. There was a thread, I, I just lost the thread I was talking about, but let me continue, maybe we'll get back to it. So let's get into this idea of crypto. Oh, right, so the issue here is that Charlie's nonce doesn't bind to any session. And indeed, neither does Alice's. So these values are easy to move between different sessions of the protocol. This is where cryptographic binding can really help. So let's talk about this idea of cryptographic context and how it relates to what we just looked at. So in a nutshell, if we go all the way to the bottom here, the issue with this situation is that between Alice and Charlie, the context of the protocol does not match. So I'm going to represent the context here as a hash tree. So if we look at Alice's values, Alice has four leaf nodes. And Charlie also has four leaf nodes for this hash tree. And the goal for context equivalence, I'm going to call this, is for the final hash trees to be equal to one another. What this essentially means is the context, the cryptographic context of the two sessions are equal. The issue we run into here is that Alice's L3 node refers to Eve. So that means that part of Alice's context is that Alice is speaking with Eve. That much makes sense. And in Charlie's context, 
is slightly different because in Charlie's context, which does include Alice, rather than the recipient being Eve, the recipient is Charlie. And this is the crucial difference between these two contexts is that Charlie believes that it's Alice and Charlie talking. Alice believes that it's Alice and Eve talking. And this is where we run into trouble. And if we represent this sort of as a hash tree and we hash all these values together and then successively hash the additional contextual values in, we end up with these final hashes, C, the C2 hash, um, representing sort of these contexts as hash, as hash states, uh, hash trees, sorry, where they're not equal. And any time where we don't have an equivalence of context at the end, that means there's a protocol interaction happening. This is what we wish to stop. And by the way, if you've seen a hash tree like this before, it's a Merkle tree. Merkle trees became super, super vogue for a while because blockchains, especially permissionless blockchains, but also consortium blockchains are a type of Merkle tree, right? You have these blocks that refer to each other and they're chained together. And this was a huge fad, you know, blockchains with this revolutionary new thing that was extremely fascinating, partially because you had things like a proof of work, which is an interesting algorithm for appending blocks by finding sort of a consensus among lots of users racing to solve a hash-based puzzle. Now, the, the fundamental structure of a blockchain goes all the way back to the Merkle tree from 1979. So this is not a very new idea. And you can essentially think of a blockchain as as, as a sort of Merkle tree that's very long, so, so more like a linked list and, and less like a tree. In fact, in blockchains, you're often trying to avoid creating trees. These are forks, right? And you're, you're usually trying to stop this. Merkle trees are super useful for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is it's a very compact representation of a potentially arbitrarily complex state. This is important because we're trying to bind arbitrary protocols. So we like Merkle trees for this application right here. So let's talk about how we can use Merkle trees to bind to arbitrary context. So the, the idea behind automatic context binding is that we're going to take existing protocols and augment them. We'll rather compose them with a context exchange protocol that's going to handle this context agreement for us. So we start with a formal specification in the strand space of a protocol. So this can be any arbitrary two-party protocol. We'll show you some examples of this. And we're going to hand it to the automatic binder, which is like a protocol, it's a Python prototype right now, that's going to infer the context from that formal specification. It's going to create a protocol composition to try and ensure this context equivalence at the end. And to make sure that this actually works, we're also going to generate security goals, which will then prove the correctness of using the cryptographic protocol shapes analyzer, which, which I'm going to refer to as CPSA going forward. So CPSA is one of many formal methods Formal methods tools for protocol analysis. It works specifically in the strand space model, and it can reason about strand spaces insofar as you can. It can both extract security goals from existing protocols, and it can prove the correctness of those security goals. So this is what we choose to use here. So the automatic binding tool is sort of part of a tool chain that includes this much more mature, refined formal methods tool, sort of overseeing everything and making sure that making sure that the result is sound. So. The un we just talked at length about the Needham Schroeder protocol, and this is sort of the un the incorrect version, the one from 1978 with the flaw. So the challenge is, can we, from this protocol specification, and you can imagine Alice and Bob to be strands here, and then we can actually represent each of these uh, messages they're exchanging as terms in the strand space model. And the idea is, can we infer a context from this? That is to say, can we decide what is the context of a session? And what does it mean for those contexts to be equivalent? So the answer is yes, by the way. We can, for instance, begin to look at the values that each strand is emitting, right? We can actually look at the terms. And this is quite important. And what we're looking for is sort of contribution to the contextual state. So let's talk about what each role here or each strand is contributing. So you have Alice contributing what is clearly a nonce, a unique nonce, so it just should be fresh, especially from Alice's perspective. And then we have also have Alice contributing an identifier. This is the initiator, right? Alice is the initiator. Alice is contributing a, a random nonce. And then we're talking to Bob, which we can extract from this idea that we're encrypting with Bob's public key. So then uh, uh, sort of in the column on the left here, we see Alice's contextual information up until this point. So Alice has a nonce, has an identifier for herself and an identifier for Bob. Then Bob is going to contribute Bob's nonce. This is actually all Bob contributes to the context. So Alice is doing the heavy lifting here of establishing the context, and Bob is appending to that context. I want to 
sort of stay on this verb. And yes, so somebody comments that this looks like a three-way handshake. It, it bears a lot of resemblance to a three-way handshake. And it actually turns out there's a reason you usually have to do at least three message exchanges, right? Um, you'll, you'll find that many mutual authentication protocols sort of have a structure like this. And by the way, we can also denote each of these contextual states based on the message they correspond to. So we actually have three contexts here, NS init, NS respond, and NS final, which correspond to the Liedem Schroeder messages. And what we're focusing on is this idea of introduced variables. So what variables is each strand introducing or what terms? And we actually only have four terms, essentially, or four, four base terms that are not derived from an encryption or otherwise that exist in Liedem Schroeder. So with that in mind, we have a context, right? We actually can do something with this. So what can we do with this? Well, let's look at some context operations. Let's define some context operations. So the point of context is we want to be able to build this tree and then exchange messages in such a way that at the end, we can make certain statements that we can prove about the equivalence of these trees we have. So let's talk about what those statements look like. So Certainly we need the ability to initiate a context. We're gonna call that init. And what init, initialize, the initializer, the init function is going to take is it's going to take meta information about the protocol. So that is to say the specific, so one issue that you can run into, right? Is that messages from a protocol can interfere with sessions of the same protocol running a different version. So we have protocols where we update the versions because we have to correct things or add features to those protocols. And we would like it to be impossible to take a message from one version of the protocol and insert it into another version of the protocol. Most protocols don't make this possible because they do actually check for this, but I want to sort of formalize this idea in context here. So part of the contextual information of a protocol session is crucially, what protocol are we running? What version of the protocol are we running? What variation, you know, if the protocol has multiple modes, what variation are we running? If you're choosing, choosing things like cipher suites, which you do in TLS 1.2 and, and I think also in TLS 1.3, you also need to be clear what cipher suites are we using. So all that is contextual information. And on top of that, let's root the context using a nonce, right? We want the contextual information to be unique to a session. So generating a unique nonce to, to help achieve this goal is, is a good idea. So we're going to do that. And then we're going to in include any introduced variables at this initialization point. So the idea is we have a protocol, we have the meta information about the protocol, we have a nonce rooting the context, giving it sort of a unique root, and then we have any introduced variables. And the idea now is we can send this context back and forth. It's a hash tree and we can append it. So the next operation is append. So append, you're going to give it an existing context. You'll specify what message type that you're appending the information for. So what message type is basically causing the context to receive additional information. We're going to also include a nonce. So every time we append this thing, we're going to include a random nonce for that append operation. And then we include any introduced variables from that message. So between init and append, we now have the ability to build up these context trees, sort of like what I showed you for Needham Schroeder. Now, an important part of this is we also need to sign the context essentially every time we append it. And this is the sort of most expensive operation we're going to do here. So give it any time we initialize our appended context, it's wise to sign it. And the reason we need to sign it is we actually want the other party that we're going to communicate with when we send it the context to have some guarantee of its authenticity. And the only way we can give it any assurance at all that we actually were the one that appended this information is by signing it. Uh, and we're going to do that using a private key corresponding to a public key the other party knows. And we'll also include a nonce for that signature. We, in the signature, we need to include the nonce that we used when we appended or initialized. And this is so that the other party knows the nonce so they can actually do the next operation, which is verify. So to verify a context, you need to know the public key of the party that's signing it, and you need to know the nonce that corresponds to the initialize or append operation. This is in a two-party context. So now we're armed with these four operations. So let's see what we can do with them. So let's look at this Needham Schroeder protocol again. So we're going to add some stuff to this now. This is still, by the way, the same message exchange. So if you look at Alice and Bob, like Alice encrypts the nonce of Alice with Alice's identifier using Bob's public key. Bob receives this, you know, sends Alice's nonce back to her with a nonce that Bob generates encrypted in Alice's public key. And then Alice responds to this challenge by encrypting Bob's key, Bob's nonce using Bob's public key. So the exact same structure as before, but now we send some additional messages and the additional messages we send comprise this context exchange protocol. And let's talk about what those messages look like. 
So prior to sending any message, Alice is going to generate the root context, the initial context, context prime, context zero. And we're going to use that, we're going to create that using the init uh, function that we just specified for contexts. And specifically, we're going to give meta information about the Needham Schroeder protocol. We're going to give meta information about the first message that we send, the initialized message. We're going to introduce this nonce R0. So the, somebody just asked a question in the chat. What is the use of nonce? So a cryptographic nonce is a random number that you generate uniquely for a session of a protocol. The use of a nonce is to give freshness to a session, as to say, to ensure that one session is distinct from another cryptographically. This is the primary use of a nonce. If you don't use nonces, what you'll find is that messages from different sessions will be identical to each other. And this is a problem for a number of reasons, but the biggest reason it's a problem is replay attacks. So one of the primary uses of nonces is to thwart replay attacks, but in general, they're a cryptographic tool for creating freshness in a session. And this is what we're using them for here. Does that sort of answer your question? Okay, excellent. So speaking of nonces, we have this nonce R, R0, which we're going to use here to create that freshness, right, for the initial uh, the initial node of the context hash tree. And then we're going to include the introduced variables in this first message, which are Alice, Bob, because we're using Bob's public key, and then the nonce Alice generates. And then what we're going to send to Bob is a signature of this context and the nonce we use to initialize the context using our private key. So Bob can verify the signature. And what Bob can do now is Bob can take that signed context and append to it because it's a hash tree, right? So we take the hash and then we add more information and we hash again. So that's exactly what Bob is going to do. We're going to append to this context we received from Alice, the meta information of the response message we're sending in, in sort of a symbolic model, which CPSA is, this is just a symbol, right? But you could conceivably, if you're implementing this, include all kinds of information here, including like, what is the specific message? What variation of the message? anything you want, essentially, because it's a hash. So no matter how much you add, you're going to hash it into this fixed size. And Bob, by the way, is also going to introduce a random nonce here for the context R1. And we're going to include the introduced variable or term from Bob, which is Bob's nonce, and we're going to append the context. And now Bob, in a manner exactly the same as Alice, is going to sign that context and the nonce and send this to Alice. So with each message exchange in the original protocol, we have this corresponding message exchange in the context exchange protocol, which we're automatically adding, by the way. So we're automatically generating these messages and, and the context operations. Alice is gonna now take this context she received from Bob, perform this append operation again, and send us to Bob in the final message. And then we add one message to every protocol where Bob is going to sign the signed final context from Alice and send it back to Alice. And this gives some assurance at the end that we actually have the same contextual information. And here now we can assert, hey, if these contexts are the same, that means that there was no protocol interference. And this is a really powerful result. And by the way, this does form a hash tree, right? So you can see this relationship between these contextual nodes and we're still very much building a hash tree here. So you can always think about context as a hash tree in this case. So let's look at another protocol, an even worse protocol, because worse in the sense that uh, Blanchet designed this to be flawed. So this is an instructional protocol that's intentionally flawed, right? And I'll show you how it's flawed. But the idea here is that Alice is gonna encrypt under Bob's public key, a signature of a, of a symmetric key S. So we introduce a symmetric key S, which is an introduced variable, by the way. So it in instantly is part of the context, right? And we're gonna sign this as Alice, and we're going to send it to Bob. And the idea is Bob is going to generate or retrieve this document D, which we don't want the adversary to know, and encrypt it using S. So we're basically saying, here's the signed symmetric key, Bob. Encrypt my document using this key and send it back to me. Perfectly reasonable idea, right? We don't want the adversary to be able to read the document D, but we want, we'd like to receive the document D. This question comes up sometimes of why don't we just use public key crypto for everything? Right? Because we have this tool of public key crypto, so why would we want a symmetric key here? Well, let's suppose that D is like really, really big. So D is like this huge document. So one issue with public key crypto is that it's way, way, way slower than, a than symmetric crypto. Something like AES-256 can encrypt some a huge document D using a symmetric key, I think, orders of magnitude faster than, than you can encrypt something like that using, say, RSA. 
So there are many situations where you don't want to use public key crypto. And this is sort of one of the things informing Blanchett's protocol here. So what's wrong with doing this? Let's talk about that. So this protocol is intentionally flawed. And the biggest issue with this protocol is that Bob has honestly no notion of who this key S is for, right? So the issue becomes much as before, if Alice wishes to speak with Eve and Eve is by the way, the network, so Eve is malicious, Alice will create this key S and sign it and send it to Eve and say, hey, encrypt my documents with this. And let's say that Eve knows that Bob also runs this protocol and is holding some documents for Alice. Well, what Eve can do is, you know, reach out to Bob and say, hey, I'm Alice and I have this key I've generated for you to encrypt the document with. But the problem is Eve already knows the key because the key was sent to Eve first by Alice, right? And then Bob happily obliges, encrypts this document D using S, Eve receives the document we've violated the core tenant of this protocol, which is that we don't want the adversary to know D. So this is a man in the middle attack caused by protocol interaction. What's the protocol interaction? Well, we're moving at S exists in both instance P and instance Q of this protocol. That is absolutely no good. We want to avoid that situation. Can we fix a protocol that's intentionally flawed using our technique here? The answer, of course, is yes. It so. Dr. Fatak poses an interesting question, which is, um, do we require a four way handshake to guarantee man sort of resistance against man, what you're calling man in the middle freshness, but it sounds like essentially the idea is resistance against man in the middle attacks. So we don't, but we do seem to require at least three. Um, I don't have a proof for that and I, I'm not aware of any proof that exists for that. It's possible that it's been, that there's a proof in a paper somewhere that, that states that you need three messages. It, it seems like there's some sort of information theoretic property, uh, but, but I'm sort of purely intuiting this, that, that, that suggests that maybe you need at least three messages, just because at least in the strand space model, you actually have no, you don't know anything about what happened to your message unless somebody responds to you. So it makes sense at the end to have sort of an exchange where we can at least see to an extent that the other party agrees with the values that we're using. If you don't have that exchange at the end, there's this ambiguity, which complicates some of the proofs we're doing. I don't know if the, I can extrapolate from there and say that that enables man in the middle attack in all cases, but we seem to need that for the proofs we're doing. So coming back to the Blanchett's protocol, we can actually bind this using automatic binding by just applying the technique before the functions from before. We take the meta information, we generate a nonce, take the introduced variables, Alice, Bob, S, sign that, send it to Bob. And this actually solves the core issue of Blanchett's protocol because Bob now knows what context S is for, like what the context of S is, right? Which was the problem up here. Bob receives S but doesn't know contextually what S is for. And we can add sort of, we're basically adding additional information on the protocol that now allows Bob to know that S is specifically for this interaction between Alice and Bob. That's the intent of it. So we can now communicate the intent of S. And that means that Bob can also communicate that, hey, like the, the document D is pertinent to this context of Alice, Bob, and S. And so at the end, we can do this exchange again. And if we achieve context equivalence here, which we do, we can be certain that there's no protocol interference. Again, a very powerful result and, and novel as well, by the way. And this again forms a hash tree. It's a bit shorter than the last one. So certainly we don't always need four messages, right? Here we can do it in just three because the original protocol is two. And if we, if we apply our automatic binding technique to any two-party protocol, we'll always add one message. So if the original protocol has two messages, we'll add one to make it three. You know, if it just says one message, we'd have two, but then I don't know. I actually haven't tried to, it's sort of strange to reason around a protocol that only has one message. I, I really can't imagine that a protocol where it's just one transmission from Alice to Bob would have many properties at all, but I guess it depends. What properties can you prove in the strand space model? That's a bit questionable because it does sort of depend on the strands exchanging terms, which wouldn't always be the case. Email. So, so uh, Ed, Ed is giving the example of email. Now, email has all kinds of security problems, though, as a resulting from that, does it not? Like, even if you're using encryption, sort of, there's this this major factor of the human being receiving a message and, and maybe not knowing what to do with it or doing the wrong thing with it. So, I think email email might actually speak to this idea that 
you know, even if you're using email, if you want to achieve certain security properties within the parameters of a conversation you're having with somebody, you might still need to exchange multiple email messages. I know that you can use PGP, for instance, to, to sort of provide authenticity to the message. I don't know what people are using these days. I know PGP was popular for a while. So I can at least know that an email comes from somebody specific, but I, does PGP actually bind to the recipient or is it just an encryption for the sender, like a signature? That's sort of something to consider, right? Because I could forward that email to somebody else if not. But it's an interesting idea. So I talked about this idea of security goals. So generating security goals is something we can do because the security goals are sort of predictable in their structure. That is to say, we really have only a few requirements here, which is that the private keys need to not be known to the adversary for both parties. So we're going to assume that, and this is actually like a pretty powerful assumption. There's this other assumption lurking under it, which is that Alice and Bob know each other's public keys. And as you know, this is, as some of you may know, this is quite hard to achieve in sort of the real world. The way we write now achieve this is we ship browsers to you. So when you download your browser, it comes with this cache of certificate authority, root certificates, basically. So you download Firefox or Chrome, and it has these pre-installed certificates for certificate root, basically these root certificate authorities. And the idea is that you can then establish a chain of trust from any certificate you receive on the web. There's just going to be this chain of signatures that has to lead back to one of the uh, signatures that one of the public keys you have, right, in, in your browser. Now, the problem with this is if somebody poisons your browser's certificate authorities, which they can try to do by getting you to run malicious software or just having you download a version of the browser that's been modified. This all falls apart, but this is basically the best we could do right now. The other problem is that the average user doesn't have a certificate. So I don't have a certificate. You probably don't have a certificate. So that means that we can't actually do part of this protocol right now because we are not in a position to send a public key to somebody with a corresponding certificate that they can verify. That's like a fundamental limitation of the internet right now, for the most part. We don't insist on clients having certificates. Most clients don't. Certificates cost money if you've ever gotten one. So, so many people don't have them. And most, so we, we are often relying on TLS to communicate with each other. TLS by default does not require the client to provide a certificate. And you wouldn't believe how many problems this causes actually. This, in many, this makes many security goals untenable under certain circumstances. The fact that WebEx, for instance, has no idea who we are can create some issues. So I'm going to make the bold statement and say that if we want to achieve certain security properties unconditionally, we actually need clients to present certificates. That is to say, like, I would need a certificate, you would need a certificate, we would all need certificates. And we'd have to send these to each other every time we talk. Moving on. Let's say that that's the case here, because this automatic binding technique actually requires that. So I want to be honest and forthcoming about that limitation. Let's also assume that Alice, this is from the initiator perspective, this context agreement. So let's assume that Alice is generating nonces freshly. And we're going to assume that Alice generates the nonce for Needham Schroeder freshly, but also important here is that Alice generates the nonce for the initialization of the context freshly. And from there, we can focus on, we can hone in on two properties, which, which need to hold. So property one is for any legitimate initiator strand. So that's any strand executing Alice's perspective. There exists a responder strand that completes the protocol with us, the protocol, the context exchange protocol. At the end, we agree on the values of Alice's nonce, Bob nonce, the identifier for Alice A and, and Bob's identifier B. We have to agree on all four of those values because they comprise the context. We also, by the way, need to agree on the meta values. So if we're, we need to agree, we're using the same version of Needham Schroeder. We need to agree we're using the same, you know, version of the messages, the same configurations for the protocol. And it's easy enough to check if we agree on these because hash functions have the avalanche effect, right? You change a single piece of the input to a hash function and the resulting hash is completely different. And if you continue chaining hashes together this way, the end result is completely different. So if even one detail does not match between Alice and Bob, the final context will be completely different. And this is, we'll be able to see this right in the protocol. And then the second property is we can't find using CPSA, or, or in this case, maybe more universally, no strand exists for which these values don't match, which means it's impossible to build an execution of this protocol for which the context at the end don't agree. 
So that's a very powerful security goal. If this holds, it means a man in the middle attack is literally impossible, right? We could formally verify that. And we do. Looking at each of these protocols, we take their unbound versions and we assert this context equivalence goal for, from the two different perspectives, the client perspective and the responder perspective. And by the way, you'll notice that from the client perspective, actually in the formal method space, at least using CPSA and strand spaces, we actually do get contextual agreement uh, from the client perspective for all for both of these protocols, right? For both the unbound medium shorter protocol, the one I originally showed you, and the unbound Blanchard protocol. So before we apply our tool to them. The issues with these protocols manifest from the responder perspective because the responder does not have enough information to know that the session they're engaging in is the session that the initiator actually started. And indeed it's not, right? There, there are man in the middle attacks you can implement against these protocols that exploit this issue. So from the responder perspective, the unbound versions do not achieve this goal of context equivalence, not even a little bit. When we apply our automatic binding tool to both these protocols, we get bound versions of them that actually do hold this goal for both perspectives. And this is extremely powerful. So one of the most powerful aspects of CPSA is that it will find, if it terminates, and that's an important caveat, but it terminates for both these protocols, it will find every possible way to compose the strands and the terms to create an ex a complete execution of that protocol. That means that if this goal holds, that there is no execution for which this goal doesn't. And that means that there is no structural way to create this protocol interaction if you have to say, if you follow the assumptions that we have. That is to say, if your implementation possesses the same assumptions of the symbolic model here, it would essentially be impossible to create a man in the middle attack. And that's really powerful. And the most powerful thing about this is that this transformation was automatic. We actually didn't have to look directly at, well, I mean, okay, so when developing the prototype of the tool, I looked extensively at both these protocols, but now I can take a protocol like this, feed it to this tool, it'll output this automatically bound version alongside the security goals for it, which we can then verify using CPSA. And if both of the security goals pass, well, we're in great shape. That means we have context equivalence at the end. So this context isn't free. It's actually quite expensive in some cases. One thing that's nice about hash trees is hashing is a very fast operation. You know, it, we've actually optimized the hell out of it primarily because of blockchains, right? So at some point it became necessary with Bitcoin and hash, it's a sort of hash cash algorithm proof of work to hash as fast as you possibly can, because it was literally, you know, the faster you could hash, the more likely you were to append the block successfully to blockchain. And that's how you get paid, right? So people develop these massive, like, you know, clusters of processors ASICs and stuff like that to do these hashes as fast as possible. So in, within the realm of computing, we're really good at hashing now. We're very good at hashing fast. So hashing quickly to create, the, to perform the context operations of appending and, and initializing, we can do that. So hashing is not too expensive. We add message overhead. We have additional messages in the protocol now, right? You know, we have these sign messages that have to get sent alongside the original messages. So we're adding bandwidth, not a lot because all we have to send is a hash. And if we're using, say, SHA-256, the hash is 256 bits. So we're not adding a ton of overhead here, but we're adding a little bit. This could matter in the context of like embedded systems or like low power devices, right? So this is where it gets really expensive. One thing you may have noticed is we're signing every single node, right, in the hash tree. Digital signatures, as I pointed out, are somewhat expensive. They use public key cryptography, which is considerably more expensive than asymmetric cryptography. So you might say, uh, sorry, more expensive than symmetric cryptography. So you might say, well, if, is that expense acceptable? Uh, I think it's necessary. You actually have to do something like this if you want to guarantee that context equivalence at the end. So yes, it adds quite a bit of cost uh, computationally to do each of these signatures. And there may be optimizations where you, where you omit a subset of the signatures. So you don't need to sign necessarily every note, but sort of it's difficult to evaluate this on an automatic basis. So the automatic tool just adds a signature sort of to every single note of the hash tree. This is a bit expensive. And maybe the final cost is, is a concern of privacy because what the context represents, what you want the context to be is a unique fingerprint of a session of a protocol. That's really what it is, right? So if I have a session of any protocol with you, the resulting context from that should be a unique fingerprint for that session, completely unique. And a potential issue with that is that you may be able to use a unique fingerprint like this to attribute a session of a protocol to somebody, 
or to do other things that may violate a user's privacy. I haven't explored this cost very much and, and we haven't looked into it terribly, but it's something worth thinking about. Um, there, there may be situations where it's advantageous for an adversary not to be able to attribute a specific session of a protocol to specific people. Last but not least, I wanna talk a little bit about what this looks like in a post-quantum world. So quantum computers keep getting better and better. It sort of seems inevitable that at some point, so the, the, the reason that quantum crypto, I think, carries a strong guarantee about man in the middle impossibility is because at least concerning the quantum bits, there's this no cloning theorem, right? You can't create copies of it. So if a man in the middle looks at a qubit, it becomes unusable for the legitimate party. Now, the thing is, we're still work. We're not working. This is not a quantum algorithm or a quantum protocol, right? We're still very much in the classical space here. So what we're concerned with is quantum resistance, not so much the properties of quantum crypto. So how do we resist somebody using a quantum computer and executing Shor's algorithm specifically to break, to break cryptographic primitives, right? This is sort of what we're thinking about. And the main cryptographic primitive we're concerned about breaking is something like RSA. So we're using digital signatures everywhere in this context exchange protocol. And the problem is that many current and, and popular digital signature algorithms are not quantum resistant. If somebody manages to get enough qubits running and they have access to you know, a machine that can execute Shor's algorithm using these qubits, they can actually factor the integers that we're using for RSA. So that would blow this up. So the most important thing then is to find something that is, is to find a digital signature algorithm that is resistant to quantum computers. Now, there's a reason we based all this on hash functions. Hash functions are not only really fast, but they have this nice property that they're actually quantum resistant. A quantum computer can, it gives you maybe a square root speed up for finding hash collisions, like brute forcing them or whatever. And, and this is Grover's algorithm. I don't know exactly how it works. So if somebody wants to chime in with more information, they can. But the idea is if we use a hash function with enough bits, so, so let's say at least 256 bits, so like SHA-256, my understanding is that a quantum computer is not going to help terribly with this. And so we turn to hash-based signature algorithms as well. And something like Sphinx, which is a stateless hash-based signature. So you have two kinds of uh, hash-based signature uh, algorithms. You have stateful and stateless. We were advised strongly by, by experts to go with something stateless here. So we would, if we were going to implement these, these protocols after creating the formal specifications for them, we would recommend or use something like Sphinx which you can look into. That's a stateless hash-based signature algorithm. And all we have to do is make sure that the hash functions we're using are at least 256 bits long, the digest, the output hashes. Otherwise you can run into issues where the space might be small enough to sort of computationally crack, right? So that's something worth thinking about. I think if you're gonna propose new protocols or new methods to do things, you should consider the effects of quantum computing on that because the march continues for those and it seems like they're getting better and better. So the long-term vision for this, by the way, there's like this grand vision for this, for this idea. This is just a small piece in a bigger puzzle where we'd like to be able to generate executable protocol source code that, that sort of comes packaged with a formal verification that, that essentially states that you can't, there's no structural protocol interactions you can do to this. And that would shut down a huge class of attacks if we get to that point. We would shut down, I would say, a majority of man in the middle attacks that are exploiting structure you might still be able to find them because of implementation errors, but you know, for generating the code using machines and the code is formally verified, we, we would actually potentially be able to reach a point where we can say, man, the middle attacks are not possible anymore. That'd be awesome. That's like the, the distant sort of grand vision, right? But in the meanwhile, you know, we have a way to bind automatically two-party protocols, which is quite powerful. And we'd like to extend this method to multi-party protocols. So many of the protocols we analyze have more than two parties. So this is like a basic limitation of, of what we're doing right now is we haven't quite found a way to extend this in a, in a way where we can reliably prove the properties of it to three or more arbitrary parties. So like there's, there's some protocols where you, for instance, have disparate knowledge between different protocol roles if there's multiple parties talking and that disparate knowledge becomes a problem when you're talking about, hey, we all need to agree on the context, which means we need to know the values in the context. So one way to potentially address this is to look at things like zero knowledge verification, where I can verify a context for which I don't know all the values, but we can execute a zero knowledge proof with each other. And we also want to look at proofs of correctness concerning the actual generalized context exchange protocol. So rather than for specific cases, 
a more general result, which we don't have yet, and we'll be working on this coming year. So exciting work. I've had a lot of fun working on this. It seems like it seems like there are some answers out there for some of the most common classes of attacks. Cryptographic binding continues to be an issue. Even right now, people are designing protocols where they're binding incorrectly. And the discussion of cryptographic binding, I think, is years behind where it should be uh, within, the, within the space of cryptographic protocols right now. So personally, I, I was very excited that we got a chance to work on this, you know, with, with funding as well. And we'll continue working on it. And if you have any questions about this, please, please let me know because I'm happy to answer them now. I would be interested if you could uh, comment on um, what is possible and what is not possible with this approach. Um, at, at one time, I was hoping that we could just stop all adverse protocol interactions, and some experts think that's overly ambitious. Could you articulate what, what might be some of the, the limits of the capabilities of this approach? Absolutely. So protocol interaction and man in the middle attacks are closely related. But a man in the, not all protocol interactions result in a man in the middle attack. There's actually a specific circuit, like it might be worth us actually exploring what the specific requirements are for a protocol interaction to result in an attack. Because for instance, one of the core tenets of protocol interactions, which I didn't discuss here, is this idea of a chosen protocol attack. And the chosen protocol attack is ridiculously powerful. Basically, what it says is an adversary is going to take your protocol and they're going to synthesize a new protocol with which your protocol is going to interact. And it seems to me that you cannot stop this completely, right? Because they can, for instance, synthesize a protocol that takes as its input the messages output by your protocol, even with the bindings. And in that case, you can show that this is a protocol interaction. Does it result in a meaningful man in the middle attack? Questionable, right? Like probably not. But, but the point is it's still a protocol interaction. So one limitation is that we might not be able to shut down the broad class of chosen protocol attacks. It, it might just be too powerful of an attack to completely eliminate. And that's sort of something that we ended up in a lot of discussions about. And it has to do just with the fact that the adversary can always synthesize a protocol, which takes as its input, some of the messages or some portions of the messages like your protocol. That doesn't seem very easy to stop. But if the adversary is limited to finding interactions between legitimate protocols people actually use, this approach is very powerful. And it seems to me that it has the capability of potentially completely eliminating man in the middle attacks in that context. So, so a model slightly weaker than chosen protocol, right? Um, at least chosen protocol in a sense that Kelsey Schneier, Kelsey and Schneier propose it in their paper. So th there's a follow-up question, which, which concerns the halting problem. So where, if at all, does my claim start to approach solving the halting problem? In a sense, maybe what I just said, right? Like if the adversary can arbitrarily choose where we're going next, then I don't know if I can ever assert that, that this chain stops anywhere because you can continue to compose more and more of these malicious protocols in a chain forever if you want to. That's never going to halt. And that might actually speak somewhat to the problem, which is that the chosen protocol attack is actually strong enough that you can continue to compose new intentionally dumb protocols with each other that, that take each other as an input. And I don't think there's an end to that, right? You can just keep going. I don't see why an adversary would ever have to stop. But is there a meaningful result to doing that? I'm doubtful, right? Because nobody is using those protocols. So, so we're much more concerned about interactions between protocols that people are using. Man in the middle attacks can happen for many different reasons. Implementation errors are probably one of the biggest reasons for them happening, but often also they are the result of these structural flaws. So that is to say somebody designs a protocol that has this this property where you can take messages or information from one session and move it to another that's a that's a major cause of man the middle attacks we're addressing that cause so we're working in the symbolic model so things like the crypto and such are perfect but you know yeah if if somebody manages to attack a protocol because it's using crypto improperly so they're able to break the crypto or it's just doing something else wrong like there's an implementation error a bug a buffer overflow whatever 
then then it may enable certain kinds of man in the middle attacks that that our approach would not prevent yeah so we're like let me make the claim pretty specific we're dealing with man in the middle attacks created by protocol interaction right pretty much exclusively here so yes they can happen for other reasons i note that uh your tool actually uh, makes a very strong assumption because you need to sign the context. So yeah. that assumes that you have public key inf infrastructure or equivalent. Yeah. And it does. when you apply this to Needham Schroeder, um, th there's the curious fact that Needham Schroeder is trying to solve that key exchange problem, but your, your protocol is assuming that already. And so, so use, using your assumption to fix Needham Schroeder seems like you're you're fixing this protocol with the assumption you've already made. I would disagree with what you're saying. So Needham Schroeder assumes also this public key infrastructure. In fact, if you look at Needham Schroeder, um, you'll notice that the protocol is using public key infrastructure. So the purpose of Needham Schroeder is not to solve the public key infrastructure problem. It's to agree on a key using public key infrastructure. So we're making no more assumptions than Needham Schroeder is. So it's, it's the same assumptions as Needham Schroeder. And Needham Schroeder makes a pretty strong assumption, by the way. But it, it turns out that if you want to achieve mutual authentication, you almost have to make this assumption. And that's the goal of Needham Schroeder. It's not one way. It's supposed to be mutual, right? So, so I don't think there's a way to, to arrive at a mutual conclusion in a protocol if we don't have some way by which to first mutually authenticate each other. And that, that's going to require a PKI. There's no way around it. Unless we just want everyone to exchange symmetric keys, you know, via pieces of paper before they talk. But I think the internet sort of scaled past that quite a while ago, right? Let me actually just stay here. Does that make sense? And yeah, by the way, so so this comes up often, and Ed makes a good point in the in the chat. So Neenam Schroeder, the original protocol is like seven messages. What I'm looking at here is the abstraction of it that Gavin Lowe makes when he breaks the protocol in 1995. He, he basically distills seven messages into three major messages that have the actual sort of cryptographic footprint of the exchange. So Ed points out that the full Needham Schroeder protocol includes messages to acquire the public keys from some PKI. And I'm not actually sure how it does that. I, I assume maybe it's using like symmetric key cryptography to communicate with some trusted third party. Or, or maybe we just come preloaded with certificates or some other method, right? But you have to deal with that problem. And the issue is that problem also involves protocols. So it's fraught with peril all the way up. So the assumption I'm making is fairly strong. And I would say probably the largest limitation of this work, the assumption that we have, you know, authenticated public keys for each other is a very strong assumption. It's not clear right now how to relax that assumption because this this stuff doesn't work very well if you don't have the ability to sign and verify each other's signatures so we ha we have to keep looking at how to improve the internet sort of infrastructure to address that weakness because i don't think we can do uh we can't we can't shut down this class of attacks if we don't that does it doesn't seem possible to me so that's a challenge for everyone here if you go on to work in you know networks or internet protocols Earlier in the talk, uh, there was a discussion of how many r rounds are necessary, and I'm just noting that I believe there's some very relevant theory uh, that speaks to this point that, that we should track down. Yeah, I, it sounds like some, I'm sure somebody has thought long and hard about that, and I would be shocked if it's less than three messages. It, three messages seem to be like s sort of an important number, <laughs> at least three, right? Like it can be more certainly, but. Uh, you, you start to run into problems pretty rapidly if you if you don't exchange more than that. Oh, what is your something. intuition for that statement? Just analyzing protocols. So it's background for me, I've been analyzing protocols and I've for for like I guess it's like seven or eight years now. And every protocol we've looked at, you know, there tend to be issues if you start emitting certain messages past some past some number and when i say issues i mean in the strand space model it becomes difficult to prove properties because there's not enough information there's not enough information exchanged um, one party usually ends up being in the dark if you don't have a, a third message exchange it has to do i guess with context like intuitively for me it has to do with context agreement I, I need to know that you actually arrived at the same values I did for me to have any certainty that we agree on the context. And there's no way for that to happen unless you tell me what your context is, which requires an additional uh, exchange of message. Right. So that's the intuition. 
but I don't have any proofs for that stuff. So for the protocols requiring at least three messages uh, to be secure thing, like are, are you specifically talking about mutual authentication protocols? Yeah, like like in the context of protocols like Needham Schroeder, mutual authentication, yeah. Because you kind of have the structure, they, they follow it, this, this structure, right? There's an abstract structure lurking underneath, which is challenge, challenge response, like response, to, like you, I challenge you, you respond to my challenge with your own challenge, and then I respond to your challenge. So it's like a challenge, challenge, response, response, challenge, response kind of thing. And that's, that abstract structure seems important for, for mutual authentication. And it, this, the structure has, you know, three messages, right? And yeah, you can always do more. I mean, you can always add more stuff, right? Like, it, you know, you could have thousands of, you could do a thousand round protocol, you know, where you're sending a message back and forth a thousand times, you're challenging and responding to each other. So you're really sure the other person is who they claim they are, but it seems like the minimum is probably three, at least if you're following this traditional structure of, I'm going to generate a challenge, send it to you, you respond to my challenge. And then you add your own challenge in your response. And then I respond to your challenge. That structure seems important. And it's three messages. I, I guess that's the intuition, right? Are there any more questions? Well, thank you very much for uh, um, interesting. Oh, I think there's a question. So Ed, says, Ed, Ed makes a comment. He says, sometimes more is not better. There are protocols where the two challenges and the responses are four messages and the protocol fails. That's interesting. I would be curious uh, to see, Ed, why it fails. Is it, does it fail because by separating the messages, we're eliminating bindings that are important? That would be my guess. Okay, so so you have to make sure that if you if you separate things out that you're still binding to the session appropriately. And that shows you how important binding is. I mean, if you if you break decompose messages when you're implementing a protocol you can break the whole thing because you break the bindings the relationships between those values right so that's a really good point and maybe a good thing maybe a good thought to leave on cryptographic binding is really important if you're designing protocols or implementing them because you can break the bindings when you're implementing it if you decompose messages you shouldn't so really well, thank nice you very much. Um, as always, I will post uh, a video of this talk to the CDL website. This is the last meeting for the fall, and we will resume when the spring semester um, kicks off. In the third week of January, um, we will be holding the SFS research study. Um, and if there are people who want to join us, please feel free to talk to me. Um, that study will focus on privacy, both technical and policy issues in the new ILSB building. Um, if you like what you've heard today, um, we invite you to join us and you're welcome to, to participate in the workshops that Ennis leads on how to do protocol analysis using CPSA. So let's thank the speaker and um, I hope everybody has a nice uh, uh, December vacation.